Good evening, guys. Pastor Thomas here. I just thought uh, this evening we would share a quick Devo in Nehemiah chapter 10. And uh, before we go ahead and dig into our word tonight, why don't we bow our heads in, in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this evening, God. We just ask for your wisdom. Lord, we want your spiritual knowledge that we can take this wisdom and apply it to our daily lives. Lord, especially, Lord, in these days, these are tough times we're going through. Lord, and we need your guidance, we need your strength, and we can certainly learn a lot from Nehemiah chapter 10 in regards to how, our li how we should live our lives these days, Lord. So we thank you, God. We praise you. We look forward to your word, and uh, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So, guys, tonight I just wanted to uh, start off before we actually uh, look at the word. I wanted to share some of the words that uh, Jesus spoke. And uh, they kind of go like this. It says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so my question to you tonight is, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? You know, it's been quite some time since I remember seeing this guy, and he used to walk up and down uh, Lambs Canyon in between San Jacinto and Beaumont, I've also seen him out in Beaumont Banning area, walking out on 6th Street, but uh, he used to, he had this big cross, and it had wheels attached to it, and this guy spent his days walking up and down the highways and byways, and he was carrying his cross, and so I ask you, is that what it means to be a follower of Christ? Perhaps to follow Jesus, maybe I need to become a carpenter. Maybe I need to get a robe and some sandals. Maybe I need to enlist 12 disciples and travel throughout Israel teaching in the various synagogues. Is that what it means to follow Christ? Well, you know, I think we realize that the answer to that question is really no. That's not really what it means to follow Jesus. And yet, we are to be his followers. We are to be Christ-like in our actions and our behaviors. You see, his life is a pattern or it's a model for us to follow. But we certainly cannot become him because he is God. And so as we've gone through this book of Nehemiah, we can kind of appreciate that we can learn a few things from Nehemiah's character. We can learn from his example as a man of God. You see... He was a strong and a compassionate leader. Nehemiah was a praying man. And when Jerusalem lay in ruins, God used Nehemiah to restore the walls because Nehemiah didn't just have a flash of emotion and then let it die. Nehemiah wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. And then Nehemiah took action. And we can learn a lot from the life of Nehemiah. And here in chapter 10, we have this covenant that was signed by Nehemiah and a bunch of other men. And so what do we do with this? Well, I think we're going to find that there's a lot of wisdom here, a lot of wisdom that we can incorporate into our own lives. And there are some other things that perhaps we should leave behind. We read in verse 29 that the people joined together with their brethren, their nobles, and they entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his ordinances and his statutes. So here's something that Jesus Christ had to say about making oaths, and it comes from Matthew 5, verses 34 through 37. And this is our first slide tonight, but it starts out with Jesus saying this, But I say to you, do not swear at all. And then he goes on to say, do not swear by heaven, because that's where God's throne is. And then he says, do not swear by earth, because that's God's footstool. He goes on to say, do not swear by Jerusalem, and do not swear by your own head. And he finishes in verse 37 by saying, let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And uh, one thing we should understand is that this really doesn't condemn 
all oaths under all circumstances, but we really should be careful not to make careless promises in our everyday conversations. And we see that these Hebrews in Nehemiah, they made an oath which they were incapable of keeping, and it brought divine judgment upon them. And if you look at their history, throughout the history of the Jew, we see persecution after persecution after persecution. And uh, like I say, verse 29 says that they entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. And covenants like this one, they were ratified by an oath ceremony. And then there was a curse rite. And it's where an animal is slaughtered. And the slaughtered animal signifies a similar fate for the covenant breaker. So some things that we can leave behind here, we shouldn't make we shouldn't make oaths that, that have a curse attached to them because we don't want God's divine judgment coming upon this. And also, a lot of the things in here, they really don't apply to our lives. Uh, we don't need to worry about making burnt offerings to the Lord. Uh, we don't need to really worry about grain offerings. We don't need to really worry about celebrating new moons and, and set feast days. Um, for the holy things, for the sin offering, to make atonement for Israel. We really don't need to worry about those things. These are all things that we can leave behind. But let's look at what we can take from these passages because there are certainly some principles that we can take from this covenant and apply to our daily lives. So let's take a look at a few of these things right now. And this is your next slide. And uh, I basically listed four things that we can apply from this covenant. Number one is to pursue his will. Number two is to honor his day. Number three is to reflect his love. And then finally, number four is to support his work. And so as we look through these things, we'll start off first with pursue his will. And it comes from Nehemiah uh, verse 30. And it says, We would not give our daughters as wives to the peoples of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. And so Nehemiah's people, they vowed not to give or take daughters of the pagan people surrounding them. And I'm sure you can figure out you know, how to apply this with your own children. But the purpose was to keep themselves separated from those idolatrous pagans in the nations that were surrounding them. That was God's will. And it's also God's will for us that even though we are a part of this world, Romans 12.2 tells us not to be conformed to this world. And so the second thing is honor his day. You see, God gave the Sabbath day for the Jews to set aside everything and honor the Lord. And for us, that day is Sunday. It's the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. And so we set aside this day, we, we set aside all the distractions of our everyday life, and we spend that day to worship our Lord. Now, I understand that some of us work on Sunday, right? And so, but the point is here that Hebrews 10.25 says not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together, especially even in this time of coronavirus. But uh, just make sure that you find time, if you work on Sunday, find time to, some time to spend with other believers in fellowship and in worshiping the Lord. And the third thing is this, reflect his love. At the end of verse 31, we read this. It says that we would forego the seventh year's produce and the exacting of every debt. And so what does that mean? Basically, every seven years, the people were to forgive every debt that was owed to one another. Now, I'm not saying that in our lives we should always release each other from the responsibility of what someone has borrowed from us, but, you know, perhaps sometimes we should. You know, and when it comes to forgiveness, that's really something that we should be practicing all the time, right? And the last thing on the list is to support his work. You know, sometimes we fail to realize what it takes to operate the church. You know, there's bills, there's the support of missions, um, there's 
helping out around the church. We have a crew that comes in on Monday that cleans up the entire church grounds, and that includes cleaning toilets and stuff like that, um, because we want to make sure that we support God's work, whether it be with our finances, whether it be with physical labor, and the truth is that it usually comes down to a few who foot the bill for running the church, and it really shouldn't be that way. And Nehemiah and his people, they made a covenant to share that burden. Verse 32 says, Also we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. And then it goes on to describe all the different first fruits that the people offered to God. And it's really speaking to us today about our tithes and our offerings. And then in verse 39, we read this. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain of the new wine and the oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are, and we will not neglect the house of our God. You know, right now on the side of uh, the church and the 300 buildings, there's a group of men that are literally tearing out everything in that building to prepare to move those buildings out of here. They are not neglecting the house of our God, and that's how we should be in our lives too. And so often, as Christian men, you know, we may listen to a sermon that is particularly convicting, or we may hear a worship song that moves our spirit to proclaim just giving our all to the Lord. But then an hour later and the cares of this world return and we've forgotten about it. And we've all read in Ephesians that we are saved by grace through faith, that not of works, lest any man should boast. Yes, it's true that our faith, our belief, makes us justified in God's eyes, but how do we grow and mature as Christians? Uh, James, in the book of James, tells us that faith without works is dead. Um, not works to earn salvation, but works because we are saved. And throughout his epistles, Paul says things like, I fight. He says, I run. In another section, he says, I discipline my body. He says, let us cleanse ourselves. Let us labor. Let us lay aside every weight. And so consider this next text, this next takeaway. You see, the devil, he isn't worried when we're convicted by a sermon. He isn't worried when we're deeply moved by a spiritual worship song. He's worried when in obedience to the Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit, and here's the takeaway, when we make firm practical decisions to do specific things for the Lord. And let me finish with this next takeaway, and it's this. In order to truly make practical decisions and do specific things for the Lord, we all need to come to this conclusion. And the conclusion is this, that God owns us and everything we have belongs to him. So please take that with you, because when we do this, then we stop asking questions like, how do I want to spend my day? And that question becomes, God, how do you want me to spend your day? And instead of, how do I want to spend my money? It now becomes, God, how do you want me to spend your money? And it's not, how much of my money do I want to give to the Lord? It now becomes, God, how much of your money should I be keeping for myself? Instead of, how do you want me to raise, how should I raise my children? It now becomes, God, how do you want me to raise your children? Not what kind of house and what kind of car do I want to have. It is now, God, what kind of house and what kind of car do you want me to have? And when we do that, then we will make firm, practical decisions to do specific things for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Lord, we just pray that in our small groups we would share with one another the truth. God, that it would impact our lives, that we would use these things in this day and age. Lord, we are in a time of crisis in America. 
Lord, but together we can stand strong. And I pray for each uh, Bible study. I pray for all the different life groups, all the various things going on, Lord, and just pray that you would show yourself true in the midst of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.